Friends and family, faculty and staff, my fellow classmates, welcome to Harvard Law School's 2018 Class Day Ceremony. <laughs> my name is Namal Awal, and it's truly an honor to welcome you today on behalf of my fellow class marshals, Marilyn Robb, Tatiana Payasova, Alejandra Huerta, Jimmy McEntee, and Cameron Pritchett. Today, on the eve of our graduation, we have so many reasons to celebrate. Not only are we here to celebrate the incredible accomplishments of the class of 2018, but we are also here to celebrate the people who guided us along the way. The professors who imparted knowledge on us while expanding our worldviews, the staff who worked tirelessly to provide us with unparalleled comforts, making us feel at home here at HLS. Our friends, family, and loved ones who cared for us in moments of weakness and rejoiced with us in moments of joy. Without these invaluable people, we would not be here today. Please join me in thanking them. Oh, no. This moment is not lost on me. As a black woman, as the daughter of Nigerian immigrants, as a first generation American, I fully recognize the power of this moment. Because like so many of you, this university was not built for me. But judging by the fact that we're all sitting here today, we most certainly were built for it. Although we may have had our doubts, a little voice inside our heads telling us that we were not good enough, smart enough, capable enough, a voice telling us that we did not belong here. The fact that we are here today is proof that we have always been more than enough. And hopefully, as more diverse students begin to fill these halls, those who come after us may feel the weight of imposter syndrome far less. Because as I look out at our class gathered here today, I know that in our diversity, diversity of backgrounds, of ideas, of beliefs, lies our collective strength. Today, as we move forward into this new stage of life, we should take time to look back at just how we got here. Take this time to get to know yourself again, your hopes, your dreams, your purpose. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to go back and read your personal statements. Perhaps we were more idealistic when we wrote those words, but maybe we can find wisdom in our words. The first line of my statement holds an important truth that I would like to share with you today. Privilege. At its best, it is a soft, warm blanket, a smooth, paved road, an outstretched helping hand, a head start in the race of life. At its worst, it prevents us from learning about the lived realities of others, those whose life experiences deeply contrast our own. Privilege. The privilege of being born a certain race or gender, the privilege of growing up in a, with a stable roof over your head and consistent meals on the table. The privilege of having people in your corner constantly pushing you to be better. In my case, a single mother who sacrificed everything, including her own legal career, in vigilant protection of my future. I love you, Mom. Now, I do not mean to suggest that all privileges are equal. They are not. But nevertheless, they allow us to move through the world in ways and to access opportunities that simply are not available to others. As soon-to-be graduates of Harvard Law School, we have been blessed with immense privilege, and we cannot take that lightly. Wielding power only matters insofar as we use it to work towards justice. And we have witnessed what happens when those in power ignore that responsibility. 
During these unprecedented times, many of us are anxious and afraid, but we cannot allow that fear to paralyze us. Now more than ever, we must work towards a more just society. We must advocate for those who cannot do so for themselves and use our power to amplify the voices of traditionally marginalized communities. People whose stories, ideas, thoughts, and beliefs are not always considered worthy. We must engage more critically, care more deeply, and speak truth to power. We have a responsibility to leave this world better than we inherited it. And I look forward to walking alongside you all as we do just that. Congratulations to the HLS class of 2018. We made it. Today, I also have the pleasure of introducing the Dean of Harvard Law School, John Manning. <laughs> Dean Manning, the Morgan and Helen Chu Dean and Professor of Law, has been a member, a member of the HLS faculty since 2004, but is in his first year serving as the Dean. Prior to entering teaching, Dean Manning served as an assistant to the Solicitor General in the U.S. Department of Justice, an associate in the D.C. office of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, and an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel in the U.S. Department of Justice. He also served as a law clerk to the Honorable Antonin Scalia of the Supreme Court of the United States and to, to the Honorable Robert H. Bork of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Dean Manning is a graduate of both Harvard Law School and Harvard College. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dean John Manning. Thank you, Namat, for those beautiful remarks and for that warm introduction. Um, I am really happy to be here today to celebrate the Harvard Law School class of 2018. To celebrate, yes, give yourselves a hand. We're here to celebrate all that you've accomplished individually and collectively, and to recognize today's honorees for all that they've contributed. Um, today's student, staff, and faculty honorees stand out for their excellence and, their for, and for their commitment to this law school and to the larger ideals it serves. I really look forward to seeing what your class does in the years ahead. Um, I'm also delighted to share this stage with your class marshals, with our president of the Harvard Law School Association, Peter Krauss, class of 1974, our fabulous staff and teaching award winners, uh, and um, I'm delighted also to welcome our distinguished uh, class day uh, speaker, uh, Senator Jeff Flake, and our dean of students, Marcia Sells. Uh, thank you for joining us on this really great uh, occasion. Um, now, I'm going to turn the proceedings uh, shortly over to my friend and my former Leg Reg student, uh, your student government president, Amanda Lee. Um, yeah, do you have Amanda around? Definitely. Uh, but before I do, I, I can't let the moment pass without acknowledging what a terrific class you are. Um, you're the first class of our third century. Uh, you are lively and energetic and committed. You've written countless papers and notes and blog posts and briefs and reports. You've respectfully discussed and dis debated the hardest questions of the day. You've established important new organizations and companies. You've gone all over the world to work and learn and contribute. Your drive and your creativity have made this law school buzz with energy and you have given of yourself through exceptional service to those who need your representation. At Harvard Law School, we require our JDs to perform 50 hours of pro bono work during their time here. The JD class of 2018 performed, are you ready for this? An average of 600
137 hours of pro bono service, more than a dozen times what's what was required. Let's give, give yourself a big round of applause for that. Ten of our graduates performed more than 2,000 hours of pro bono work. And another 113 performed more than 1,000 hours of pro bono service. All right, you ready for this? All told, your class, the first class of Harvard Law School's third century, has contributed 376,532 hours of pro bono service. That is a record. Congratulations. Let's give this class a big hand. Now, I'll have more to say tomorrow, um, uh, but for now, uh, let me just say how proud we are uh, that you are soon to be alumni of the Harvard Law School and how much we look forward to celebrating you over the next two days and how much we look forward to seeing and hearing and participating in what you accomplish over the length of what we know will be wonderful careers. And so without further delay, I will turn the proceedings over to my friend, Amanda Lee. Good afternoon, class of 2018. I know I've sent a lot of emails to you this year. But don't worry, if you're getting nostalgic about receiving student government updates from myself or Amanda Chan, we spam alumni too. That's how I know from a very scientific and reliable survey that the three things recent alums miss most about HLS are cold calls, how the HARC closes at two on Fridays, and that oppressive silence of 100 people trying to be quiet at the same time on the fourth floor of Langdell. Um, and I'm just kidding, you won't receive emails from us as alums. Really though, <laughs> I am so excited to be here celebrating with you as we finish our adventure. But I know that means that we will soon be going into countless different directions. I'm sure many of you type A planners have already figured out your path to world domination in 10 years. In your journey ahead though, you might one day wonder, where are my classmates now? Who is running for office? Who has the dream job that I want? You might even think about how that person you've always admired from afar is doing. It's therefore my distinct pleasure to introduce someone who has spent many of his years ensuring that HLS alumni stay close even as opportunities and obligations pull us afar. Peter Krauss is the president of the Harvard Law School Association, the HLSA, which is over 38,000 members strong and is our law school alumni network. As president of the HLSA, Peter has led alumni to connect everywhere from Hong Kong to Russia, Lebanon, and Brazil. And just last week, he convened alumni in Rome for the bicentennial celebration, where they met the president and the chief justice of Italy, and where they probably actually enjoyed pizza lunch talks. <laughs> but even as exciting as Peter's life sounds, I know that he's most excited about the dynamic involvement of new graduates joining the network. And as a graduate of this law school, as well as a proud father of two more HLS alumni, Peter has given the following advice. 
follow your heart and do what you love because you may well be doing it for the rest of your life. And it's a mantra he's thoroughly lived by as he's transitioned from advising as a lawyer at Cleary Gottlieb to strategizing as a managing director at Morgan Stanley and later being a founding member of Greenhill & Co, an investment bank. He's also served as a lecturer at Cornell, which surely demonstrates the utility and the versatility of the law degree. So as we enjoy our celebration this day, let's be even more excited for becoming alumni and learn how we can stay in touch and build on each other's successes. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Peter Krauss, president of our alumni network. Well, thank you, Amanda, and congratulations on being the Harvard Law School Student Government President. It's a great honor. Good afternoon. <laughs> My respect and great affection to Dean John Manning, officiating over his first Harvard Law School commencement, Senator Jeff Flake, Dean Marsha Sells, all our other dignitaries, honorees, graduates, families, and friends. We have been blessed with a new great dean who has been a star in practice, government service, and academia, and I'm very happy that the stewardship of our fabulous school is in his gifted hands. How about some applause for the great class of 2018? Now, I'm going to reverse it now. Would all graduates, anyone getting a degree tomorrow, please stand up? Just graduates. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, graduates. Now I'm telling the graduates, listen, I want the graduates to applaud their family, friends, and teachers who made this day possible for them, whether present or not. In your lives, thank those loved ones. Without their guidance, without their guidance, love, and support, you wouldn't be here today. So resume your seats, and let's get started. OK, as Amanda referred, it's been my great pleasure to sit in those seats on three occasions. 44 years ago, I sat out there with my parents, happy and proud to receive my Harvard Law School degree. 35 years later, 2009, my wife and I sat there and watched our daughter Christina receive a Harvard Law School degree. And we returned three years later, 2012, when, uh, I'm a little bit egocentric, Peter Christopher Krause Jr. <laughs> got his JD. So you can see that this wonderful institution is a great part of the family legacy, and that's why I've been blessed to serve it for now 47 years. It's an honor to serve as president of your great Harvard Law School Alumni Association. And let me be frank and a touch immodest. You graduates are joining one of the most prestigious organizations in the world. There's nothing I can think that'd be better for your careers than to be a graduate of the Harvard Law School. HLSA is the oldest law school alumni organization in the world and serves 38,000 living alumni by supporting and sponsoring a number of programs and events. It is the vital link between our law school and its increasingly diverse and global alumni body. The HLSA motto is stay connected. And the slogan I adopted for my two-year presidency, which ends June 30th, was plant the HLS flag around the world, reflecting my career in the international arena in law and in uh, investment banking and private equity. During our bicentennial year, we have conducted over 100 domestic programs, including three fabulous reunions right here on campus, titled HLS in the Arts, HLS in the World, and HLS in the Community. And we also conducted major events in Beirut, Belgrade, Budapest, Hong Kong, 
Rio de Janeiro, Rome, Sao Paulo, Seoul, Tel Aviv, and Tokyo, and we have programs upcoming in Russia and South Africa. I'd like to just highlight three of those programs to show you the value of the convening authority of the HLS brand. First, um, Seoul. A year ago, uh, with my predecessor, Salvo Arena, and the president of HLSA Asia, YJ Kim, we did a bicentennial program in Seoul. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of South Korea had a reception for us, and I'm wearing this rather bright tie because it's a present, and it says on the back of it, Office of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Korea. So he welcomed us, gave us all presents, and the next day we went up to the DMZ and had a rule of law program in the Blue House, where you might have seen recently the two heads of North and South Korea met to start, hopefully, the uh, a reunification and a denuclearization program. I'll jump now to Beirut. I was in Beirut a month ago, and we were uh, invited up by the president of Be Lebanon to his pass a palace up on a hill. And that was the night, as we're doing our program on the t local TV in Beirut, the US carriers and destroyers shot the missiles over our head to take out the gas producing factories of the Assad regime in Damascus, Syria, just 50 miles east of where we were sitting. So we were watching the, the smoke uh, lines of the missiles going over our heads, hitting the gas producing factory. And finally in Rome, as uh, Amanda just said, just two weeks ago, I was with Dean John, Steve Oliveira, Karen Chance, and the other leaders of the HLSA, and met with the president of Italy, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the president of, this, of, the, of the Senate of Italy. So none of them would have been interested in meeting Peter Krause, but when the dean or the president of Harvard Law School is there, he can show even governmental leaders come to meet with us because of the, the significance of this name around the world. The other thing about significant about your opportunity the last three years is to have been educated by world-class teachers. And I would like you to pick a professor or professors, could be a composite of several, who taught you in the last few years and emulate them in your career. It might be Dean John Manning. My uh, professor who I try to emulate in my career was a, a man by the name of David Hurwitz. David's retired and you, none of you would have had him, but he taught me business planning. The substance of the course in 1974 related to a lot of what I did in my career. Corporate finance, capital markets, tax, accounting, but the intangibles that Professor Hurwitz instilled in me were far more significant. The qualities of organization, integrity, fairness, hard work and accomplishment, Professor Hurwitz personified. I summarized the guidance he gave me in three principles, which I repeat to myself every day and used to raise my three children and uh, all the analysts and associates and junior officers I managed at Morgan Stanley, Greenhill, and Cleary Gottlieb over the years. It's a total of only six words, three rules, but I'll throw them out there. Maybe they'll stick with some of you, and I hope you can use them in your lives and careers. Be early. Be prepared. Be excellent. Be early, be prepared, be excellent. Professor Hurwitz got those into me, and it worked for me, and I hope it helps some of you. There's an inscription on a plaque in Langdale Library here behind me, which I first heard in 1974, and it struck me significantly. And I've kept it in my mind for decades as a good definition of the importance of law. It was written by John Arthur MacArthur McGuire, who is a graduate of our law school class of 1911, and he taught here as a professor from 1923 to 1957. You will all hear it tomorrow in Tercentenary Theater when President Drew Faust confers the Harvard Law School degrees upon you. It has been so used by Harvard University presidents conferring those law diplomas since 1935. I quote it. You are ready to aid in the shaping and application of those wise restraints that make men free, close quote. As your alumni president, 
I urge you to be an active graduate and stay connected and volunteer for HLS. I strongly encourage you to plant the HLS flag in your personal lives wherever you go and exemplify our school's timeless values and ideals. Emphasize the rule of law to assure our society is just and to keep men and women free. I wish you much happiness in your personal lives, great satisfaction and success in your professional careers, and may God bless each and every one of you. Many thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda Chan, and it's been an honor to serve you all this year as your student government vice president. Today, we celebrate the contributions that faculty, staff, and students have made to the HLS community. No celebration would be complete without recognizing the hard work of the Restaurant Associates team, as well as the dedication of the custodial, trades, and landscaping teams. <laughs> Led by Marcus Callagher, John Amato, Tony Cabuccio, and Joe Ribeiro. These individuals are with us every step of the journey from admitted students weekend to class day to future alumni reunions. In particular, I hope you join me today in, in thanking Tony for 17 years of dedicated service. <laughs> and wishing him well in his retirement. Prior to joining Harvard in 2001, Tony led a fruitful career as an auto mechanic, Volkswagen service manager, and entrepreneur. He is the wizard behind the curtain of many campus productions, including today, and he spent the past weekend has, as he has in previous years, staying overnight on campus to oversee commencement preparations. On behalf of the class of 2018, thank you, Tony, and thank you to the rest of our amazing support staff for making every day on this campus possible. It's been such a pleasure to share this experience at HLS with you all. Good afternoon. My name is Jimmy McEntee, and I have the distinct honor of presenting the 2018 Suzanne Richardson Staff Appreciation Award to Edgar Clay Filio. The award is given each year to a member of the staff who demonstrates commitment to the student experience and concern for students' lives and work at the law school. There is no one more deserving of this award than Mr. Clay Filio. Mr. Clay Filio serves as the point person for the Dean of Students Office and is the first person to greet students. His knowledge about getting things done in the law school is simply unparalleled. Students that need assistance filling out forms, organizing events, reserving rooms, or even satisfying their sweet tooth turn to Mr. Clay Filio for help. When students reach out to Mr. Clay Filio for, with a problem, he does more than provide a solution. Mr. Clay Filio drops what he is doing and provides options, resources, and advice on the best course of action. However, it is Mr. Clay Filio's ability to connect with students and his genuine interest in students' lives that make him so deserving of this award. Law school can admittedly feel isolating and stressful at times, yet for any student, 
visiting the dean of students' office, Mr. Clay Filio has the power to brighten up their day. He goes to great lengths to learn the names of all students that enter his office, and his dedication to cultivating relationships with students has helped build a sense of community in the law school. Whether through a smile, a what can I do to help, or a piece of candy, Mr. Clay Filio has improved the student experience at Harvard Law School. As one, as one nomination said best, more than a staff member, Edgar Clay Filio has been my friend. Thank you, Edgar, for your dedication to students, and congratulations on receiving the 2018 Suzanne Richardson Staff Appreciation Award. Thank you. As if I was not nervous enough to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Edgar Clay Filho, and I work in the Dean of Students' office. I'm freaking out out here on this stage right now, <laughs> just so you know, just reminding you. First, I need to thank all the students who nominated me for this award, JDs, SJDs, and LLMs. You have made me happy beyond what you can imagine. Thank you. When I started working at the DOS, I wondered how I could be more than the person that, who answers the phone or responds to the emails every day. It didn't take me long to notice the pressure of your first year at Harvard Law School. I could measure your stress level through your visit to the candy bowl. <laughs> Shy in the first year, but by the third year, there was no shame. Just a <laughs> hi, bye, and a handful of full of candies. <laughs> Your reasons? Tough class, schedules, exams, rainy day, cloudy days, snowy day, <laughs> long days, dark days, friends in your class who asked you for candies, imaginary friends that I would never meet. <laughs> I hope Jenna is around so she knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm a candy dealer. <laughs> and my clients are not only students. On the administration side, I have clients in the admissions office, registrars, clinical in pro bono, OCS, academic affairs, yeah. And I, have, <laughs> and I have clients on this stage as well, but I'm bound by confidentiality agreement not to mention their names. <laughs> I need to say that to be able to do the work that I do, I have an amazing group of co-workers at DOS who always stop what they are doing to help me with, when our students come asking for information. This includes Dean Sells, who trusts my judgment and allows me to schedule meetings after, after hours if necessary. And depending on what is, is needed, our help also comes from the custodians, FMO, grounds, or from the registrar's office, graduate program, facilities, and so forth. On a personal level, I remember what my mom taught me since I was a kid. Actually, my mom and my family is watching from Brazil, Cuiabá, right now. Oi, mãe, e todo mundo no Brasil, beijão. My mom used to say that with hard work and kindness, I would always find an open door wherever I went. And I have followed her advice since then. In 2003, I was hired to work for the Harvard Landscape Group, and I heard about the Harvard Bridge Program where I could take English classes during my work shift. I would go to class in my work clothes after cutting grass, raking leaves, or shoveling snow all day. But I was happy I could improve my English. In 2005, while taking care of the HLS camp campus, I found out that facilities office front desk person was leaving and I decided to apply. 
I got a job. Then, <laughs> then I decided to pursue my college degree while working full time at that office. It was not easy, but I received my BA in psychology. Then in 2014, there was an open position at the OS, and I told Jeff McNaught that I would love to work there if they thought I could be a good fit. They thought I was, and here we are. <laughs> it has been my focus since I came to America to learn the language and fit in. I wanted to obey the law and behave like any good citizen. This award is the recognition of everything I have worked so hard for all these years. <laughs> and, I would, and I would not have done so well all these years without the love and support of Brian, my husband, my best friend, and who has been by my side for the past 13 years. Thank you, baby. For my wonderful graduate students, I want to say this. I am very lucky to work in a place that respects me for who I am. I am a gay man. I am a spiritist. I am a person of color, and I am an immigrant. You have treated me as an equal this, these years that we have been together, and I did my best to be kind and respectful to you in return. We are fortunate here at Harvard Law School to have such a diverse spectrum of opinions with journals and organizations representing all sorts of social, political, and academic areas. We have been able to get along despite our differences, so I'm sure it can happen out there in the places you will be living and working after leaving HLS. So please, in a moment in this country with so much hate and division, choose be to be kind. Don't let gender and sexuality divide you. <laughs> Don't let religion influence your decisions if you says the contrary. Don't let race overshadow what you have learned here, and don't turn your back on the history of this country that this country has of welcoming people like me from all over the world. <laughs> I'm sure you will do great things and you'll be successful wherever you are because you are the best new lawyers in the world. I will miss you very much. There you go. <laughs> but I will never forget this incredible honor you have given me today. Good luck and many, many thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alejandra Huerta Gutierrez, and it is my privilege to introduce the Albert M. Sachs Paul A. Front Award for Teaching Excellence. This award is presented to a single faculty member each year for teaching ability, attentiveness to student concerns, and general contributions to the Harvard Law School. Today, I am delighted to introduce Professor Carol Steiker as this year's award winner. Since day one at Harvard Law School, we are faced with choices. Did I choose the right law school? Should I lo join the law review? Should I run for class marshal? Should I actually become a lawyer or get an advanced degree? We cannot help but think how our life choices have brought us here today and where they will lead us to in the future. 
As a graduating class of 2018, we were honored to have received advice by Professor Steiker through her participation at the last lecture series a few weeks ago. At a crucial time for us on our path to graduation, she was kind enough to share with us her choices and successes, inspiring us to choose wisely and forge our own paths. However, she was also humble enough to share with us snapshots from her life with some disappointing experiences, as she called them, ultimately helped create and shape her life today, which we, as a graduating class, along with faculty, staff, family, and friends, celebrate today. We celebrate today the turns in life that have led to Professor Steiker's fight for justice and to opening up difficult conversations for us and our society. As the Henry J. Friendly Professor of Law and Faculty Co-Director of the Criminal Justice Policy Program at HLS, Professor Steiker has shown an unparalleled commitment to criminal justice and to the humanization of the criminal justice system. Professor Steiker has also been a strong advocate for defending those that have been disadvantaged by the system. Through her continued efforts in the field and tireless work and as a public defender, pro bono litigator, and consultant, Professor Steiker has tremendously advanced the studies in the field and has inspired us, has inspired us to use her own legal studies and practices to shape a more just society. Not only is Professor Steiker a leading voice in the field, but she's also an exceptional scholar. Her publications and contributions have also been a drive to open up conversations about issues that permeate our society and those of my classmates from around the world, ranging from capital punishment to the relationship of the criminal justice scholarship to law reform, the role of mercy in the institutions of criminal justice, and the likelihood of nationwide abolition of capital punishment. Her most recent book, Courting Death, The Supreme Court and Capital Punishment, co-authored with her brother Jordan Steiker of the University of Texas School of Law, published by Harvard University Press in November 2016, won the 2017 Robert W. Hamilton Book Award at the University of Texas. Congratulations, Professor Steiker. She has also been described by a classmate as a type of professor that students dream of having and that others professors seek, seek to emulate. A professor who does not shy away from the tough conversations. A professor that encourages her students to lean in when things get hard and who does the same thing herself. Professor Steiker, you are an, are an inspiration for us as law students and as future graduates. You have motivated and challenged us through our time here at HLS to open our minds and think critically and actively ab about those issues affecting us as a society, and most importantly, on how to approach them. You have inspired us to recognize the deficiencies in the legal system and find ways to address them through our work. But most importantly, whether we become public defenders or arbitrators or go into the corporate world, you have inspired us to look for justice and to embody justice ourselves. Thank you for empowering us to make our choices, for inviting us to embrace our, our, our mistakes and to welcome the lessons behind them. Today, we thank you for becoming a part of our lives and helping shape what we have become at Harvard Law School. Thank you, Professor Steiker, for keeping us excited and motivated about what's to come. Without further ado, please join me in congratulating Professor Carol Steiker, recipient of the 2018 Albert M. Sachs Paul A. Freund Award, for teaching excellence. Thank you, Alejandra, and thank you, class of 2018. I am deeply honored to receive this award from you. It's especially well-timed because the day after graduation, I will head back to Harvard Yard to attend my 35th college reunion. And I've been thinking about and remembering fondly my own education at Harvard College and at Harvard Law School. My professors meant a lot to me then, but even more over the years. As with many things, I don't think I fully appreciated my years as a student while they were happening, even though I mostly enjoyed them at the time. I am thrilled 
to think that I have, may have done my own small part to pay that debt forward. For most of you, this graduation will mark the end of your student days. No, Bar Review doesn't count. <laughs> and I'm sure that it's bittersweet to close the door on this era of your life. Many exciting new opportunities and experiences lie ahead of you, but the intensity, camaraderie, and sense of discovery of student life are unique. You too will likely appreciate it more as time goes on. But here's the good news. Some of the best parts of HLS you get to take with you, not just the knowledge that you've gained and the skills that you've acquired, and not just the friends that you've made who will accompany you and celebrate with you the career and personal milestones that lie ahead, promotions, weddings, children, and yes, reunions. There's more. There are two additional aspects of life at HLS that I urge you to nourish along with your skills and your friendships and to keep alive in your professional and personal lives. These are two things that I didn't even know I missed until I came back to teach at HLS after working as a lawyer for six years after my own graduation. My first real job as a lawyer was as a public defender in Washington, DC. I loved being a PD and was proud to serve my clients. One of the things I loved most about the job was how deeply I connected with my fellow PDs. We had so much in common, similar worldviews and commitment to our shared mission. We worked long hours together, collaborating on our cases and celebrating our victories and mourning our defeats as a community. The founder of the Public Defender Service where I worked once described that intense camaraderie by quoting King Henry's speech to the outnumbered English soldiers about to fight the French at the Battle of Agincourt against overwhelming odds, the famous St. Crispin's Day speech from Shakespeare's Henry V. In it, the young King Henry invokes the bonds of comradeship that will be forged in the heroic battle that lies ahead. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. That was an apt literary reference for my own experiences as a young public defender. But after this experience of shared commitment to zealous advocacy, I returned here to HLS to teach and rediscovered the two precious things that I hadn't fully noticed or fully appreciated during my student years. First, there were many people here who did not share my deepest commitments. And while it is without a doubt energizing to be in a milieu of unspoken affinity, it is also exciting and stimulating to be among those who hold different beliefs and ambitions. I have loved the way you, class of 2018, have surprised and challenged me in class and outside of it. You noticed new things in cases I thought I had completely mastered. You pushed back against assumptions that I hadn't thought needed defending. You came up with new and insightful turns of phrase that I shamelessly stole. <laughs> Don't leave this gift behind. You will find yourself, if you're lucky, in your own band of brothers and sisters. But don't close yourself off. Make new friends or keep old ones who see the world differently from you. Don't dismiss at family events those relatives who hold what you might think are benighted points of view. Yes, I'm talking about some of the parents, grandparents, siblings, and others sitting right beside you today. Follow news media from other perspectives. One of my law school classmates once commented that practicing law makes you sharp by making you narrow. Resist. Your practice may specialize, but you can take the gift of breadth and diversity of views with you, though you will need to work at it and resist the easy comfort of the welcome embrace of your comrades in thought. 
And I promise you, if you are able to recreate in your lives some version of the sometimes uncomfortable breadth of viewpoints that HLS so effortlessly offers, it will make you a better lawyer. It will also make you a better friend, partner, parent, and citizen, exactly what our fragile democracy needs. The second gift of Harvard Law School that I rediscovered upon my return was escape from the role of advocate. Don't get me wrong, I loved being an advocate. But I missed the third question. You know, after you read a difficult case for class, the first question is, what did the majority say? The second question is, what did the dissent say? But the third question is always, what's the right answer? What should the law or policy be? You'll likely be surprised and a little dismayed at how infrequently this question gets asked in the course of your professional life. Most of you will work for much of your careers for clients who have their own agendas. You will advise them, but it won't be often that they'll be asking you what's best for society as a whole. I say, keep asking yourself that question. Perhaps surprisingly, it will make you a better advocate, but it will also allow you to take on leadership roles in law reform and public service as your career develops. Exactly what we say we're training you for by asking that third question. I'd like to close by sharing the irony I'm experiencing in the act of giving a graduation speech more than 30 years after my own HLS graduation. Although the typical mode of the graduation speech is that of imparting wisdom, I honestly feel less sure of what I think than I did when I was your age. I have come to see many more shades of gray and to realize that I know less than I thought I did when I was younger. I feel less certain, more humble, more open, though this may not be exactly how you experienced me in class. <laughs> but I welcome this perspective and I foreshadow it for you as you embark on the many experiences that I predict will engender it in your older selves. But here too, there is good news. I may be underselling the accumulation of wisdom over time. In this vein, I'll leave you with an evocative image from one of those college classes that I've been remembering fondly as my reunion approaches, a terrific course called Life on Earth that was taught by the inimitable Stephen Jay Gould. Professor Gould described the knowledge that we keep accumulating as the volume of an expanding sphere or balloon, and the boundaries of our knowledge, the things, the things that we do not yet know, as the surface area of that sphere. That is, our knowledge is the air inside the balloon, and the boundary of our ignorance is the rubber stretched taut around it. As the sphere of our knowledge expands, the frontiers of the unknown expand as well. But here's the really cool insight that geometry offers. The ratio of surface area to volume of a sphere does not remain constant. Volume grows proportionally faster than surface area, which means as our volume of knowledge grows, it outpaces growth, exponentially speaking, of the area of our ignorance. Hopeful food for thought. Graduating class of 2018, may your spheres be ever expanding. Thank you and congratulations. Dear class of 2018, family, friends, dear faculty and staff, good afternoon. 
My name is Tatiana Payosova, and as a class marshal of the graduating class of 2018, I have the privilege to introduce Dean Marsha Lynn Sells, who will announce the student awards. But before we proceed with the official awards, I would like to mention those people without whom I believe these awards would not have been possible, and each of whom, in fact, deserves their own special award. Our partners, family, friends, who helped us become who we are, who supported our most ambitious ideas, among others applying to Harvard, and continue to encourage us to dream big and to be our better selves. Our professors and HLS staff who not only guided us through the uncharted waters of law and the HLS student life, but also became our mentors and helped us implement our formidable academic and professional endeavors. Finally, our classmates, and now our true friends who shared with us the joys and challenges of pursuing a Harvard Law degree. They not only helped us stay sane after endless hours spent in the Langdell Library, but also challenged us to rise higher, to do better, and inspired us. Please join me in thanking them. Now back to the official part. Dean Sells really needs no introduction. As Dean of Students, she was a focal contact point for many of us. All of us benefited directly or indirectly from her immense support during our time at Harvard. Dean Sells received her JD from Columbia and is a member of the New York Bar. Before joining Harvard, Dean Sells held a variety of high-level positions in academia, the private sector, and public service. To mention just a few, she served as Dean of Students at Columbia Law. She was running organizational development at Reuters America and the National Basketball Association. Dean Sells also served as Assistant District Attorney for the Kings County District Attorney's Office and worked in the Chadbourne Parks Litigation Department. Dean Sells received the Woman of Power and Influence Award from the National Organization of Women, and Black Star Magazine honored her as a community leader. My favorite part of the Dean Sells bio, though, is that before joining college, she was an avid ballet dancer of the Cincinnati Ballet Company and eventually of the Dance Theater of Harlem. With all these accomplishments, but foremost, because of her passion and her devotion to whatever she does, be it ballet or law, Dean Sells is a true role model and a source of inspiration for many of us. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dean Sells. Hi. So class of 2018, you and I started Harvard Law School together. Uh, August of 2015, I introduced myself as the Dean of Students, although I probably knew less about the place than some of you. But I am so glad to have been part of the journey for the JDs and also to have had this experience each year of meeting new LLMs over these last three years. So I'm really excited about announcing these awards for each of you. So without further ado, we'll start. The Andrew L. Kaufman Pro Bono Service Award. The Andrew L. Kaufman Pro Bono Service Award is granted each year to honor Professor Andrew Kaufman, who has been instrumental in creating and supporting the Pro Bono Service Program at HLS. The award is given to JD students in the graduating class who exemplify the pro bono public spirit and extraordinary commitment to improving and delivering high quality volunteer legal services to disadvantaged communities. Selection is based on service to law-related public service projects or organizations. 
the quality of the work performed, and the impact of the work on the community. I'm delighted to announce that there are three 2018 Kaufman Award winners. I know that uh, we may not have two, but I do ask that those who are here please stand. Edith Galway, Song Galway, and Tabitha Page Cohen, and Anne Marie Manhart. I have, oh, I love that. We've got pom poms. Edith, Edith, let me speak. Edith contributed nearly 2,000 pro bono hours by working with three student practice organizations, Harvard Immigration Project, Harvard Law Student Advocates for Human Rights, and Project No One Leaves. In addition to working as a student attorney for four semesters with the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, she spent spring breaks volunteering in Texas with the South Texas Pro Bono Asylum Representation Project and with the American Gateways. Her commitment to social justice also extended throughout her summers. She worked with the Instituto with Instituto para la Migras en la Migración in Mexico City and with the Bronx Defender's Office. Edith consistently tackled case challenges. Now we go to Edith consistently tackled case challenges head on and proposed innovative solutions. She took the lead in developing a partnership between the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau and the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinic. Particularly in cases involving immigrant youth and the special protections afforded to them, she worked with the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau to find representation for Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinical Program clients who needed help in family court. Her supervisors from the Harvard Immigration Refugee Clinical Program said, we are impressed with Edith's ability to anticipate legal pitfalls and to proactively craft creative arguments around those pitfalls in order to move her clients' cases forward. Tabitha and Anne Marie won the Andrew L. Kaufman Pro Bono Service Award as a team for their commitment to serving the cause of prisoners in Massachusetts, especially those who are disabled or elderly. Tabitha and Anne Marie both participated in the Harvard Prison, the Harvard Prison Legal Assistance Project and the Criminal Justice Institute. At the Harvard Prison Legal Assistance Project, they spent hundreds of pro bono hours as co-executive directors managing a multitude of daily internal governance and programming issues. Throughout their time, they demonstrated tireless effort and dedication to advocating for the needs of prisoners by conducting investigations, counseling, and interviewing clients, and presenting compelling arguments and hearings. Their supervisor, John Fitzpatrick, said, these prisoners have unique challenges and are largely ignored, and Anne Marie's unsung heroics have helped dozens of these prisoners who otherwise would not have had a voice in this, in this system. In a precedent-setting case for an elderly disabled parole client, Tabitha argued before the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, whose ruling extended the Americans with Disabilities Act to mentally and physically disabled prisoners seeking parole. As a result of the case, the state must now help parolees get support systems in place in, com in the community. The case is now quoted by other disability rights groups seeking to vindicate the rights of these particularly marginalized prisoners. While at HLS, <laughs> Tabitha, Edith, and Anne Marie, we are so proud to see you receive this year's Kaufman Award and are thankful for your tireless work. The William J. Stunts Award. Seven years ago, we lost a beloved colleague, mentor, and friend, William Stunts a renowned scholar of criminal justice who died after a long battle with cancer. Bill was a recipient of the Sackfroyd Teaching Award in 2004. 
In his honor, the law school established the William J. Stuntz Award to recognize the graduating student who in his or her time at Harvard Law School has demonstrated an exemplary commitment to justice, respect for human dignity, and compassion. I'm delighted also that members of Bill's family are here with us today. Mrs. Ruth Stunt Smith, her husband and honorable, the Honorable Herman J. Smith, retired Massachusetts Superior Court judge, and son Andrew Stunts. Please thank them for coming. The winner of the 2018 William J. Stunts Awards is Margaret Kettles. Margaret, Margaret, throughout your time at Harvard Law School, you have consistently demonstrated a tireless commitment to helping those in the greater Boston community navigate the justice system and access their legal rights. You have been an active and dedicated member of numerous student practice organizations and clinics on campus, including the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, Harvard Defenders, and the Tenant Advocacy Program. In these organizations, you have performed more than 2,000 hours of pro bono work, helping countless individuals stay in their homes, stay out of jail, obtain protection from abusers, reclaim stolen wages, obtain benefits, obtain damages, and stay in the United States. As executive director of the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, you kept the nation's oldest student legal services office and the second largest provider of legal aid in Greater Boston running on a day-to-day -day basis. One of your nominators said, Margaret Kettles is the kind of student we should all be striving to be. She is an all-giving individual who is going to go out into the world and do things with her degree and have an incredible, tangible impact on all those around her. For these reasons, we are delighted to honor you with the 2018 Stunts Award. Our next award honors the late professor David Westfall, who taught at the law school for more than 50 years until his death in 2006. David was beloved by students. At a time when many faculty were contemplating retirement, he enthusiastically volunteered to lead one of our new sections in 2002 and enjoyed terrific popularity in the role. Nominations for the Westfall Award are submitted by faculty, staff, and students. It is fitting that we honor his memory by recognizing a student who has made significant contributions to their class over the last three years. This year's David Westfall Memorial Award goes to Laura Amagen Townsend. Laura, your classmates as a whole seem very indebted to you. Your nominators quite clearly see you as their community leader. One commented, Laura was a true leader of the social committee as a 1L, planning events and exerting a lot of efforts to ensure that everyone in our section felt comfortable being with each other. Another said, Laura is one of the few people who has kept in touch with as many Section 5 students as possible. Laura's, <laughs> Laura's willingness and ability to befriend everyone was noticeable as early as 1L orientation. She showed up to every event and made it a point to try and speak with each one of her classmates. Additionally, your peers appreciated your um, cross-community involvement in the Women's Law Association, Middle East Law Students Association, Immigration and Refugee Clinic, U.S. Attorneys Clinic, and the Gender Violence, Violence Legal Policy Workshop. Laura, for these reasons, we are delighted to present you with this year's Westfall Community Leadership Award. The Rickheimer Prize is awarded annually 
to a graduating student in recognition of exceptional citizenship within the law school community. Faculty, staff, and students submitted nominations for the Rickheimer Prize. And I'm a pleased to announce that this year's recipient is Amanda M. Lee. Amanda, your nominators collectively highlighted, highlighted your dedication to solving problems, promoting inclusivity, and advocating on behalf of the entire HLS community. Through your involvement in student government, the Women's Law Association, Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, the Tenant Advocacy Project, and more, you have demonstrated your immense commitment to making HLS a better place. Many of your peers mentioned your strength as a leader. One student said, Amanda embodies the values, character, and diplomacy of a true community leader. As student government president, she served as a trustworthy liaison between students, faculty, and staff, building a relationship of mutual respect and teamwork. Amanda's strength, and I know this definitely, <laughs> after many hours in the DOS office, is vouching for the student body. Even when it meant engaging in difficult conversations, it is all the more impressive because it was always coupled with collegiality, good humor, and commitment to making a reasoned case. In addition, many students emphasize the lasting impact you've had on the community through your efforts negotiating free bar prep courses for students going into public interest, spearheading the launch of an annual mental health survey, helping create affinity group co coalition. And as one student said, you're leaving behind a stronger, more cohesive, and more supported community. Amanda, with all my heart, I am really, really so happy to say these are the reasons we honor you and present you with the Rickheimer Prize. And now, to honor a number of students who also have been serving this community. Next, we present the Dean's Award for Community Leadership. Students receiving this award have enriched our community in a myriad of ways, through academic excellence, public service, creative vision. Nominations for the Dean's Awards were submitted by faculty, staff, and students. I will ask that each of the awardees stand and remain standing until I've read all the names. And unlike Dean Manning, who likes to have everybody applaud all the time, I am going to ask that you hold applause so that we can give huge, rousing applause for everyone. So the recipients of the Dean's Awards for Community Leadership are Miriam Ansari. Pauline D. Arnold, Sarah Holland Buko, Amanda Ha Pu Chan, Amir Adeline Farhadi, Nadia Laura Farjud, Amy Feinberg, Charles William Fletcher III, Pavni Garg, Alejandro Huerta Gutierrez, Harung Michael Jung, Yami Ken, Stephen A. Knight, Namat N. Lowell, James Joseph McEntee Jr., Melissa Mehat Mikal, Heinrich Nemshek, Tatiana Pasiova, Darshna Pashkar, Cameron Joseph Edward Pritchett, Marilyn Gabrielle Robb, Charlotte Robinson, Raj Salhutra, Susan E. Schlossberg, Julian Spearchief Morris, Samantha Spearman, Ernesto Thomas Velasquez, Amame Umana, Amy Elizabeth Volez, Haraka Yamamoto, thank you all for your service.
And now I am very happy to turn over the mic to Cameron Pritchett, who will introduce our class day speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cameron Pritchett, and thank you again for joining us for the 2018 Class Day Ceremony. A special thank you to my amazing parents, grandparents, family, and friends for not only making the journey here, but getting me to where I am today. I love you all. Today, I have the great privilege of introducing our Class Day speaker, Senator Jeff Flake. In preparing these remarks, I've had the opportunity to reflect on my own Harvard Law School experience and some of the lessons that I've learned over the past three years. Much of this learning, of course, occurs in the classroom due to our amazing professors that we're fortunate to have. A special thank you to all of our professors, and for me, particularly Professor Lazarus, for building a wonderful community within Section 5 from the very beginning. <laughs> this learning has also occurred in our student groups. I've learned a tremendous amount from my classmates about leadership. For instance, this year, I've watched Jasmine Carr as she led the Black Law Students Association in its 50th anniversary and all that was entailed in that significant milestone. I watched David Phillips as he led the Federalist Society and continued to put on events that promote discourse and a robust exchange of ideas on campus. And this year, I had the chance to watch Darshna as she led the Board of Student Advisors and furthered its mission to help 1Ls assimilate into the law school community and strengthen their legal research and writing skills. Mm. Our students spent countless hours putting on programming events, meeting with prospective students, and building community throughout the law school. I'm grateful to have met such passionate people, and I look forward to having these friendships that I know will be lifelong. One of the things I've enjoyed most is that HLS is a place that cultivates intellectual curiosity. As soon as I walked onto campus, I quickly realized that a cursory understanding of an issue would not suffice. I can recall an early discussion during orientation with some of my classmates in Section 5 at Cambridge Common. All of the apprehension and insecurity that came with being a 21-year-old straight through from college was palpable as I listened to them discuss topics that were beyond my knowledge and experience. I decided to leverage my undergraduate business education and slyly change the topic to something that was more in my wheelhouse. I executed the move brilliantly and shifted the conversation to a safe topic, college sports, <laughs> only to quickly realize that I knew nothing about that topic either. <laughs> there are plenty of smart people everywhere but it's been a pleasure to be constantly surrounded by people who are not only intelligent and thoughtful, but are also dedicated to continuing to learn on a daily basis. Something else deeply embedded in the culture at HLS is the importance of service. Our faculty have served the country in a number of ways. From Professor Jack Goldsmith leading the Office of Legal Counsel, Samantha Power serving as representative to the United Nations, and Mark Wu, conducting research on international development and economics affairs for the World Trade Organization. Our faculty includes former judges, executive branch officials, and even a 2016 presidential candidate. We've been immensely privileged to study under not only gifted lecturers, but also individuals who have leveraged the Harvard Law School platform to make an impact on many other individuals throughout the country. And this mentality extends to our classmates as well. Our very own Adrian Perkins is currently running to be mayor of his hometown in Shreveport, Louisiana. <laughs> Gareth Rhodes is running to be representative for New York's 19th Congressional District. <laughs> Raj Saholtra is co-founder and CEO of Swag to College, a nonprofit committed to giving students the tools to not only obtain a college education, but also thrive in a college environment. Finally, after graduation, Steve Soley is headed to Nashville, Brianna Hexham to Korea, and Johnny Stormo to Germany to serve in our military's JAG program. <laughs> service of all kinds, community service, military service, and public service is a fundamental part of our class and of our school. 
I'm proud to introduce a speaker who embodies this ideal, Senator Jeff Flake. Senator Flake's public service has taken many forms over the course of his life. During college at Brigham Young University, he took a two-year absence to volunteer in South Africa as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. With my parents in the audience, I can confidently say that my college experience was just a bit different. <laughs> Senator Flake retained an interest in the economic development of African countries as he later returned to Namibia to serve as executive director of the Foundation for Democracy. Namibia officially gained its independence from South Africa in the early months of 1990. As executive director, he assisted in the country's burgeoning democracy during one of its most fragile periods. Due to the senator's efforts and his lifelong interest in Africa, President Obama selected him to join on a 2016 trip to the continent. Afterward, Senator Flake and President Obama lobbied for support for the Power Africa program. Power Africa has invested more than $14 billion to date to expand the availability of electricity to millions of African people. Yes. Given his commitment to public service, it is no surprise that Senator Flake would eventually seek elected office. He was first elected to a seat in the House of Representatives in 2000. He represented his constituents in Arizona's East Valley for a full 12 years before successfully running for Senate in 2012. After nearly two decades in elected office, the Senator's record is filled with a litany of accomplishments, many from stints on the Judiciary Committee, Foreign Relations Committee, and Energy and National Resources Committee, to name a few. But rather than reading off his legislative accomplishments, I want to identify a few areas where he has demonstrated something else that I've learned at Harvard Law School the importance of voicing dissent when it is most difficult. For instance, in 2010, then Congressman Flake was one of only a handful of Republicans to vote in favor of repealing the discriminatory policy known as Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The Senator's willingness <laughs> The Senator's willingness to diverge with his party is perhaps most pronounced in international affairs and immigration. For more than a decade, Senator Flake has been the lone Republican urging for expanded diplomatic relations with Cuba. After President Obama ended the nearly 50-year estrangement with Cuba, Senator Flake was the only Republican to join administration officials on a flight to Havana to bring home American Alan Gross, who had been jailed on the island for five years. Senator Flake is known by his colleagues for his sincere desire for bipartisan work. In 2013, he teamed with four Democrats and three other Republicans to form the Gang of Eight. The group worked tirelessly to develop comprehensive immigration reform, which created a pathway to citizenship for our country's undocumented workers. The group's bill passed the Senate with more than 60 votes. However, Google was uncertain about what happened to it after that. Beyond these individual policies, over the past two years, Senator Flake has come to embody one final lesson that I've learned at HLS. Silence is acquiescence. The Senator has been vocal in rejecting attacks on the foundation of our democracy. He has done so despite having to break with his party at times, disagree with many of his constituents, and draw the social media ire of one cantankerous individual in particular. In an era in which certain individuals have attempted to delegitimize our free press, Mr. Flake has taken to the airwaves and to the Senate floor to condemn these pernicious attacks. As Senator Flake once stated, the free press is the despot's enemy, which makes the free press the guardian of democracy. Senator Flake announced last year that he will not seek re-election for the Arizona Senate seat, but I'm sure that we have not heard the last from him. Without further ado, please well, join me in welcoming to Class Day from the great state of Arizona, Senator Jeff Flake. Thank you so much. Dean Manning, 
Dean Sells, Peter Kraus, graduates, class marshals, family, faculty, it's wonderful to be here today. And how about this Arizona weather? <laughs> I have one thing to say, you're welcome. <laughs> it is such an honor to stand before you today on this very special day of celebration. It's accomplishment for you and your families. This is the annual season of advice giving. That's why I'm here. I'm very much hoping you can give me some advice. <laughs> you see, I'm gonna be on the job market soon. So I'd appreciate anything you can do for me. But I am truly privileged to get this invitation. Congratulations to the Harvard Law Class of 2018. Now, to be here in this place that has produced so many of our nation's leaders and our finest legal minds is deeply humbling. An institution that gave the world Oliver Wendell Holmes, a majority of the Supreme Court, and not only Barack, but Michelle Obama, too. It all leaves me wondering how I got this invitation. It might have come by mistake, but thank you. This day takes me back to my own decadent celebration after graduation at my alma mater, BYU. Bowl after bowl of Rocky Road, double fudge brownie, butter pecan. When you're Mormon, ice cream's all you've got. <laughs> but I'm not only humbled to be at this place, I'm also humbled by the moment this moment in the life of our country. You see, you're set to inherit the world just in the nick of time. I'm also especially humbled given the fact that I come to you today from the political class. In utter seriousness, it's I who could benefit from listening to you today rather than speaking to you. I'm not sure there's much distilled wisdom imparted from Washington these days especially given what has lately become the tawdriness of my profession. I'm here today as a representative of a co-equal branch of government, a branch that is failing its constitutional obligations to counteract the power of the president, and in so doing is dishonoring itself and in so doing is dishonoring itself at a critical moment in the life of our nation. And so, with humility, let me suggest that perhaps it's best to consider what I have to say today as a cautionary tale about the rule of law and its fragility, about our democratic norms and how hard fought and how vulnerable they are, about the independence of our system of justice, and how critically important it is to safeguard it from malign actors who would casually destroy that independence for their own purposes and without a thought for the consequences. About the crucial predicate for all these cherished American values, truth, empirical, objective truth. And lastly, about the necessity to defend these values and institutions that you will soon inherit, even if that means sometimes standing alone, even if it means risking something very important to you, maybe even your career, because there are times when circumstances may call on you to risk your career in favor of your principles. But you and your country will be better for it. You can go elsewhere for a job, but you cannot go elsewhere for a soul. Now, not to be unpleasant, but I do bring news from our nation's capital. First, the good news. Your national leadership is, well, not good at all. Our presidency has been debased by a figure who seemingly has a bottomless appetite for destruction and division, and only a passing familiarity with how the Constitution works. 
and our Article I branch of government, the Congress, that's me, is utterly supine in the, visit, in the uh, face of the moral vandalism that flows from the White House daily. I do not think that the founders could have anticipated that the beauty of their invention might someday founder on the rocks of reality television and that Congress would be such willing accomplices to this calamity. Our, <laughs> our most ardent enemies doing their worst, and they are doing their worst, couldn't hurt us more than we are hurting ourselves. Now you might reasonably ask, where's the good news in that? Well, simply put, we may have hit bottom. And that's also the bad news. In a rare convergence, the good news and the bad news are the same. Our leadership is not good, but it probably can't get much worse. This is it, if you've been wondering what the bottom looks like. This is what it looks like when you stress test all of the institutions that undergird our constitutional democracy at the same time. You could say that we are witnesses to history and if it were possible to divorce ourselves from the obvious tragedy of this debacle, I suppose it might even be interesting. The same way some diseases are interesting to medical researchers. But this is an experience that we could and should have avoided. Getting to this state of distress did not naturally occur. Rather, it was thoroughly man-made. This disease of our polity is far too serious not to be recognized for what it is. The damage it threatens to do to our vital organs is far too great for us to carry on as if all is well. All is not well. We have a sickness of the spirit. To complete the medical metaphor, you might say that we're now in critical condition. How did we arrive at such a moment of great peril wherein the President of the United States publicly threatens on Fox and Friends, historians will note, to interfere in the in administration of justice and seems to think that the office confers on him the ability to decide who and what gets investigated and who and what does not. And just this week, the president, offering an outlandish rationale, ordered an investigation into the investigation of the Russian attack on our, our electoral process not to defend the country against future attacks, mind you, but to defend himself. Obviously, ordering investigations is not a legitimate use of presidential power. I pick this egregious example of recent presidential conduct not because, because it is rare in terms of the president's body of work, but because it so perfectly represents what we have tragically go, grown accustomed to in the past year and a half, who would have thought that we would ever see encouragement coming from the White House for chants at rallies calling for the jailing of a defeated political opponent? When you don't even know what the limits of presidential power are, you might not even care when you're abusing that power. How did this happen to us, and what might we learn from it? How did we get swept up in this global resurgence of the authoritarian impulse which has democracies teetering on the brink, strong men placing themselves above the law, and in our own country a leader who reveres some of the most loathsome enemies of democracy in our time? Have we really grown tired of democracy? Are we watching its passing? cheered on by the America First crowd, even as we cast aside global institutions that have fostered freedom and peace for more than a half century. For just a moment, let us marvel at the miracle that is the rule of law. We have seldom been moved to pause for such an appreciation, as we've been busy taking it for granted and assuming its inviolability, like gravity, but unlike Newton's laws, the rule of law was neither innate nor inevitable. What goes, down, what goes up must come down is a piece of cake compared to curbing the impulses of man and asking free people to abide norms and rules that form a country 
and foster civilization. It took centuries of war and sacrifice and social upheaval and more war and great civil rights struggles to establish the foundational notion that no one is either above the law or unworthy of the protections afforded by a robust legal system. A system that took us from feudal civility A system that took us from feudal civility to a constitutional model that is the envy of the world and will continue to be with your help. We trace the beginnings of this radical egalitarianism, the awesome and leveling effect of the law to the glorious revolution of 1688, which saw the death of the divine right of kings, as even the monarch from that point forward would be subject to the rule of law and the Parliament even threw in a Bill of Rights for good measure. But we are now testing the durability of this idea that William III had the good sense to agree to, an idea that was then forged and tempered over ensuing centuries, and we are seeing its vulnerabilities. In other parts of the world where democracy's roots are not so deep, we're seeing it being torn down with sickening ease and with shocking speed. And worse, we are seeing the rise of simulated democracies, Potemkin democracies, democracies in appearance and effect only. Rule of thumb, if the only acceptable outcome in a matter of law or justice is a result that is satisfactory to the leader, then you might be living in a democracy that is in trouble. If the leader attacks the legitimacy of any institution that does not pay him obeisance, say, the independent judiciary or the free press, you might live in a democracy that is in trouble. Further to that point, when a figure in power reflexively calls any press that does not suit him fake news, it is that person who should be the figure of suspicion, not the press. It will be the work of your generation to make sure that this degradation of democracy does not continue, to see that our current flirtation with lawlessness and authoritarianism does not become a heritable trait passed on from this presidency. The rule of law is an elemental value, a value that preceded and gave rise to our Constitution. It is not an ideology subject to the pendulum swings of politics or something to be given a thumbs up or a thumbs down during a call to your favorite morning show. It is the basis of our system of self-government. America without the rule of law is no longer America. I am a conservative Republican, a throwback to the days when those words actually meant something, before the collapse of our politics into the rank tribalism that we currently endure. My sounding this alarm against the government that was elected under a Republican banner and that calls itself conservative makes me no less Republican or conservative. And opposing the president and much of what he stands for is not an act of apostasy. It is, rather, an act of fidelity. Because we forget this fact far too often, and it bears repeating a thousand times, especially in times such as these, values transcend politics. Now, as a conservative Republican, I dare say that my idea of government may differ from the beliefs of many of you here. I will be thoroughly presumptuous and assume that in terms of policy prescriptions, we disagree on much. Call me crazy. But I have long believed that the only lasting solutions to the problems before us must involve both sides. Lawmaking should never be an exercise in revenge because vengeful people are myopic, self-interested, and not fit to lead. I believe that our government should include people who believe as I do 
just as I believe it should include people who believe as my friend Tim Kaine does or my friend Cory Booker does. I'll let Tim and Corey know you applauded. <laughs> the greatness of our system is that it is designed to be difficult. That is in order to force com uh, compromise. And when you honor the system and seek to govern in good faith, the system works. Which brings us back to our current peril. It is a testament to our times and to the inflection point that we now face that I am here today for setting aside the usual requirements of politics and the usual way that politics keeps score, the things that normally divide us seem trivial compared to the trials that have now been visited upon our democracy. In the face of these challenges, we agree on something far more important than a legislative program, even more important than our thoughts on the proper role of government in the economy and the lives of individuals. We agree on the need to safeguard the health and survival of constitutional democracy in America and the preservation of the American idea itself, underpinning the constitutional system and that extraordinary idea that is under threat right now from the top. The values of the Enlightenment that led us to the creation of this idea of America, this unique experiment in, the world, in world history are light years removed from the base, cruel, transactional brand of politics that at this moment some people mistakenly think is what it means to make America great. To be clear, we did not become great and will never be great by indulging and encouraging our very worst impulses. It doesn't matter how many red caps you sell. The historian John Meacham, in his splendid new book, The Soul of America, reassures us that history shows that we are frequently vulnerable to fear, bitterness, and strife. The good news, he says, is that we have come through such darkness before. Perhaps, but not with both nuclear weapons and Twitter. And certainly not with such an anomalous presidency as this one. But I take your point, Mr. Meacham, and I am heartened by it. We will get through this, of course. But we are at the moment, we are in it. And we must face it squarely. Because too much is at stake for us to turn away, to leave it to, to others to defend the things that we hold most dear. A culminating event such as the election of our current president scrambles normal binary uh, notions of politics. And I'm as disoriented as many of you here at this de-alignment de that we're experiencing. We find that many of the day's biggest issues simply don't break down neatly in familiar ideas of left versus right, but rather along these lines. Do you believe in democracy or not? Are you faithful to your country or to your party? Are you loyal to the Constitution or to a man? Do you reflexively ascribe the worst motives to your opponents, but somehow deny, excuse, or endorse every repulsive thing your compatriot does, says, or tweets? These questions have some of us wandering in the political wilderness. And it is in that wilderness where our, your wonderful letter of invitation reached me. Well, the wilderness suits me just fine. In fact, I so love the way Washington has become that in recent years, during congressional recesses, I've taken to stranding myself on deserted islands in the middle of the ocean, just to de detoxify all the feelings of love out of my system. I'm not kidding here. I once spent a week alone, voluntarily marooned on a tiny island called Jabinwad, a remote spit of sand and coconut trees in the central Pacific, about 7,000 miles from Washington. As penance and determined to test my survival skills, I brought no food or water. 
relying solely on what I could catch or collect. That, it turned out, was the easier part. More difficult was dealing with the stultifying loneliness that set in on that first night and never left me. By day three, for companionship, I began to mark the hermit crabs that wandered through my camp with a number, just to see if they would reoccur. By the end of the week, I had 126 numbered friends. I still miss number 72. He rarely left my side after developing an addiction to coconut scraps. I was less fond of number 12, who bit my or pinched my big toe. Now I wouldn't recommend such drastic measures to escape your own situation. But I hope that should you be presented with the choice, you too would eschew comfort and set out into the wilderness rather than compromise your conscience. From my cautionary tale to you today, I urge you to challenge all of your assumptions regularly. Recognize the good in your opponents. Apologize every now and then. Admit to mistakes. Forgive and ask for forgiveness. Listen more. Speak up more. Sometimes politics keeps us silent when we should speak. And if you find yourselves in a herd, crane your neck, look back there, check out your brand, ask yourself if it really suits you. I can say from personal experience, it's never too late to leave the herd. When you peel off from the herd, your equilibrium returns, food tastes better, you sleep very well, your mind is your own again. You cease being captive to some bad impulses and even worse ideas. It can strain relationships, to be sure. It can leave you eating alone in the Senate dining room every now and then. But that's okay. To revise and extend a remark the President himself may recognize, you might say that I like people whose minds weren't captured. That one was for you, Senator McCain. We're all pulling for you. Politically speaking, I've not changed my beliefs much at all, but my goodness, how I have changed. How can you live through these abnormal times and not be changed? Our country needs us now. Our country needs you. We need each other, and it is a scoundrel who would prosper politically by turning us against each other. For our time, let us send a message into the future that we will not or we did not fail democracy, but that we renewed it. That a patchwork of populist resentments and authoritarian whims that for a while succeeded in its cynical mission of discord had the ultimate effect of shaking us from our complacency, reminding us of who we are and of what our responsibilities are to each other, of reawakening us to our obligations as citizens. Let us be able to say in the future that we face these forces that would threaten our institutions and tear us apart, and that we said no. I leave you today with more good news than bad news. This time I'll start with the bad news, which is all of this is yours to fix. All of it. And of course, that is also the good news. All of this is yours to fix. And our country could not be more fortunate than to have people of your high character, strong principle, and often an awesome talent to soon take the helm. I grew up as a kid on the F-Bar Ranch in rural Arizona. And if we needed to gauge the condition of the range or measure the damage after a flood, we'd find the highest hill or butte and ride our horses to the top. From such a vista, we could dispatch cattle or cowboys to gather cattle, machinery to shore up roads, workers to repair fences, to restore some semblance of order. There are no tall buttes in Washington, but it is nonetheless 
our obligation to assess the condition of our politics, then to mitigate and repair the damage. This is a story of America, though, and we will be better for the hard lessons of this experience. We are a much better and more decent people than Washington shows us to be. We are a deeply resourceful and resilient nation, and our greatness is based on no one man, no one man who alone can fix it, but rather on enduring ideas of self-governance and the rule of law that have been the model of the world for centuries, ideas that can be mocked but not marred. No, there are no high buttes in Washington, but still, we must gain the high ground and survey the damage. And the thing about gaining the high ground is that from up there, you can see beyond the damage, too. You can see everything, everything that is good and decent. That is the job before us, to get through this and beyond it. And you are just the ones to take us there. Thank you, and once again, congratulations to the Harvard Law Class of 2018. My name is Marilyn Gabriella Robb, and it is my privilege to wrap up this ceremony. At the conclusion of my remarks, we invite you to join us at the crossroads to celebrate the graduating class, as well as the friends, family, and support system that allowed us to be here. Then next time we come together as a law school, we will officially receive our Juris Doctor degrees, our degrees in the law. But what does that mean? As a community, we confronted this question during what was for many of us our first semester at HLS, when someone used black tape to deface the portraits of our black law professors. At a community meeting to discuss this racist act perpetrated in our own hallways, one of our classmates asked whether Harvard Law School is an armory or a place of enlightenment? In other words, is the point of law school just to give us tools to represent any client on any side of any controversy? Or alternatively, do our law degrees empower us to question? Whatever work we do, we will be affecting human lives. Our work in this field will have consequences for better or for worse. Members of the class of 2018, to what ends will you give your talents? The choice is yours. We often hear lawyers described as risk averse, and there is an aspect of this profession that discourages us from forging new paths. As law students, we're really good at studying what other people have done, what other people have thought. We learn and analyze and apply the ideas of others. We argue about how the ideas of others should be interpreted and applied. And that's largely the practice of law. The common law method teaches us to apply the rules of yesterday to the problems of today. But if Martin Luther King is right, that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, then tomorrow must be more just than today. And it is for us to reconsider the laws and conventions of yesterday. So let us not confuse what is established with what is right. Because laws are never immutably established. Laws do not exist in nature. People create them. 
everything about the law was thought up by people. People no smarter, no more thoughtful, no wiser than the members of this class. Members of the class of 2018, how will you shape the law? Again, the choice is yours. When we leave here, we will work in law firms, in government, in Fortune 500 companies, on international tribunals. We will be judges, politicians, public defenders, educators. The members of this graduating class will influence the making of foreign constitutions, the balance of power in our criminal justice system, CNN ratings. The influence of Harvard Law alumni is everywhere. Members of the class of 2018, how will you use your Harvard Law degree? Once again, the choice is yours. And this, this is just the beginning. Congratulations to the Harvard Law School class of 2018.